going. Do you see it? On my end? Oh, I don't know. You said yes. Oh, I'm okay. just responding. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, we are good. We are live. We are, everybody can see our smiling faces. The assistant is um, moving the links over from one video to the other. We need to figure this problem out um, so we can uh, do this properly in the future, uh, which would be good. But today I have Jarrett Crawford in the house. How are you doing today, Jarrett? What is up? I'm doing good. Awesome. Just finished work for the day. Uh, and did you work hard or hardly work? Um, just in case anybody's watching, I did work pretty hard. <laughs> Good answer. Good answer. Well, let me give you a little intro and then we'll jump into Ooh. the questions. Okay. Uh, Jarrett Crawford is the founder of Crawl TV, a YouTube channel teaching people how to work on their Jeeps, along with showing amazing trails across the United States. He has never owned an automobile or a two wheel drive automobile until just recently when he bought a Prius, even though I promised I would not bring that up. Uh, <laughs> we are excited to have him back in the state of California and to, for the restart of the Crawl TV channel. Um, we are ready for the action, Jarrett, and welcome to Snail Shop Talk. How are you doing? Thank you. It's a nice introduction. Um, Things are good here. Uh, really excited to get back into pushing those videos out, getting that content out, and then doing those cross-country trips that I used to do, mm -hmm. um, you know, with um, some of our fellow YouTubers. So, and then getting up near you, actually. I want to do Ford Ice. I'd love to do the Rubicon. Um, California is a pretty awesome place for off-roading. Yeah. Yeah, we are. We do have a bit of a gem out here with like, you know, just Hammertown and Johnson Valley area and, yeah. you know, which is more down in your neck of the woods. And then, um, you know, the Rubicon and Fort Ice, which is more up where I'm at, but just some amazing trails out here. We are, we are <laughs> fairly lucky people. That's for sure. Yeah. So. Yeah. But uh, let's, uh, how's COVID treating you? I know that you are like way out, live in the middle of some boondocks and on down a dirt road <laughs> for two miles and need to drive the Jeep to work when it's muddy. Uh, yeah. How's COVID affecting your daily life? What's going on? Um, anything exciting? Uh, definitely nothing exciting. But um, so in early March, I did my last event. So I work for Baja Designs as the sponsorship and event specialist. Uh, that keeps me on the road about half of my time. When there's no national pandemic going on, I'm out there hustling, setting up, tearing down, running these shows, usually by myself, um, and they're nationwide. So my 34 show tour this year was supposed to include um, a whole bunch of East Coast shows, Overland Expos, um, Jeep Jamborees, you know, just your average Jeep shows like the New Jersey Jeep Invasion and Jeep Beach and Mayday Miami and Sheriff's Jeep Fest. Um, let's see, what are some other ones? All the way up to Pennsylvania, we had Bantam Jeep Festival. Um, a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff. I was actually a little bit overwhelmed thinking about how much I was going to be gone, but it has completely dropped to zero. So COVID-19, um, had like specifically targeted my department first because mm -hmm. the last show I did was early March and it was the Indianapolis truck show um and that was the work truck show and that was like you know industrial we're talking snow plows dump trucks cranes um wow. more industrial lighting more contract work um and i had an expo set up there with meyer distribution and it was dead and that was like phase one of covid19 affecting me personally as a sponsorships and events specialist i spent mm -hmm. an entire weekend out there it was freezing cold i walked everywhere um it was like a small SEMA for dump trucks is what i kept calling it but since then every single event since that last event in early march has completely canceled so that wipes out 50 percent of my schedule now the other 50 percent has also fallen through but in a different way because as you know before you and i uh, talked before this call and we've talked earlier last week um the second half of my job is all sponsorships. So that's dealing with 
YouTubers, dealing with ambassadors, dealing with SEMA builders, um, mm -hmm. you know, and when the pandemic hit, it forced our company to um, break up our hours, separate our employees, and then those who can work from home will work from home. And then we have been through a few rounds of layoffs as well. So um, it's slowed down our business in response to this, but everybody else's response to this was to minimize their shop builds. They're not, people aren't taking their Jeeps to shops right now to get built. So we're seeing, you know, our retailers are affected by it. And then um, our, sorry, I, I meant to say our, our, our dealers are being affected by it, but our retailers are also being affected by it. We do not take walk-ins at our shop. Um, mm -hmm. Everything has to be bought online. And then because of, um, we, we manufacture over 65% of our parts US, but some are outsourced. We have screw boards and lenses and O-rings and little pieces that you wouldn't think are that big of a deal. Um, but when the ports get blocked up and everything else happens, we can't build our lights. All of our lights are built to order. So we've been through some big back orders that we're recently recovering from. So this pandemic has been an absolute nightmare for my job, um, but we've had to adapt, right? So obviously if I'm not doing sponsorships and I'm not doing events as a sponsorships and events guy, I got to figure out what I can do. Um, we've been doing a lot of um, promotional work, revamping our site, doing um, social media giveaways, content strategy, partnerships with other brands. And then I've seen a lot more like e-events popping up. So Easter Jeep Safari, for example, when that canceled, right. we transitioned our EJS ride, which we had planned into a virtual e EJS, where it became a contest and a giveaway. And um, we used our same partners for that event, but it was a zero attendance event because it was all online. So we're doing what we can to still be relevant, still be out there and engage with the customer base that we can, we can no longer reach without events. So I've been working in my little tiny house um, and just sitting on my computer all day on my couch. Can't say I love it, but I normally commute over an hour. So it's been nice to just get up in the morning and roll right into work. Yeah. Yeah. The commute time you can't complain about. Yeah, not at all. Oh, and like you said, yeah, I live on a 120 acre ranch and it is four miles of dirt road to get out to me. And, um, you know, we've had crazy rain in California. So my Prius just, it just can't do it. There's no way. My Jeep was actually the only vehicle for a while that could get in and out. And so I was wow. running the shuttle service back and forth for my family. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty crazy. I think it's, that's so neat that you have that land out there that, um, you know, just has some, um, so much culture and heritage to you guys and your family. Yeah. And, you know, it's just like, it seems, I don't, you know, whenever I see any videos of it, it's like, you just drive out into the middle of nowhere and then you're like, Oh, look, a Jeep out here, yeah. way over in the middle of nowhere, abandoned that everybody thought forgot about, you know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's crazy, you know, that that's, there's all that stuff on that property, you know? So yeah. um, I know that you had, you've been building this tiny house. Have you, uh, has this always been a plan for you to build this tiny house in this little spot of your, um, the family land so that whenever you come back or whenever you come to stay that you would have a place? Yes. And um, it's something I always wanted to come back and do. Mm -hmm. um, it just, you know, there was never, there's never, ever, ever a right time to dump a year of your life into building a tiny house. But <laughs> um, in late last summer, when I moved out here from Florida, it just seemed like the right time. I called my parents when I was in, I think, Texas, and I was driving out to California. And I was like, I'm finally going to do it. I, I know, you know, I've always wanted to, I'm going to build that mm -hmm. house because this structure was here. It's been here since the 1930s. Oh, okay. And it was Wait, just, is this the place of, that has the loft that you used to sleep in? No, no, that oh. was a different place. But um, okay. that was out by a pond on another part of the property. <laughs> but um, this was actually, it was dirt floors, no plumbing, no electricity, um, completely isolated. And it was just four block walls and a chimney. So there was mm -hmm. no, there was no foundation or structure to it. It didn't make sense. It had a slanted roof on it. It was kind of falling apart, but it's a grandfathered structure on the property. Right. And so it, I don't know, it just kind of all came together where I wanted to build it. And then um, I 
when I moved out to California, I was actually unemployed for a few months. So I had an abundance of time and right. uh, I just got started on it, but it took, it took a lot out of me. Um, it's not even close to done yet, but I live in it now. So getting there. Well, what else do you have to do? So I put the in-ground plumbing in, um, I poured the foundation, I reinforced the walls. I've made the roof mm -hmm. an A-frame roof. So it's okay. vaulted and it has two dormers in it. And then I have a loft that I sleep in back there. Um, what I have left to do, all the electricity is done. The plumbing works. Um, I need to get gas line run because I don't have hot water yet. Yep. And then um, I just need to put floors in and finish up a few things like behind me over here. I've got a construction ladder that I've been climbing up and down to go to the, to the loft where I sleep. Um, I need to build like, you know, the final touches and we've got okay, a wood yeah. mill out here on the property. So I just need to um, go cut some logs up. I make all my own furniture and everything. Wow. That's so cool. Do you, so do you go and get the wood though, or do you just fall a tree? Yeah, no, we go pick it up. Um, okay. My stepdad has a dump trailer mm -hmm. and I welded this big arch on the back of it with three shackle points that he hangs snatch box off of and so he's got a winch in the very front of his dump trailer and he'll dump the trailer and run it through the snatch block mm -hmm. and then he can actually pick the log up and when he dumps it back down it pulls the front of the log into the trailer and then he just drags it the rest of the way in so we have wow. probably three acres on our property that's all logs and the tree trimming companies call us and we'll pick them up for free because if we don't pick up the log the tree trimming companies have to cut them into pieces that they can haul away. So it's a win-win. That's really cool. Yeah. That did, so did you figure that out? I mean, um, how'd you guys figure that out? That you could set the snatch blocks up that way and move the trailer and have it pull it in um, or out? So my stepdad, right before I moved out here, he had a partner that he was running his, his wood milling business with. And his partner was in the border patrol and ended up getting relocated from the Mexican border to the Canadian border in Vermont. So they used to set up a ramp and then the ramp would get drug up into the trailer with the log. But once he became a one man operation, he needed some help in figuring out how he could pick up these logs. Some of them weighed 10,000 pounds. He had to figure out how to pick them up by himself. So yeah. um, it was just trial and error. It wasn't the first idea I had but it works out really, really well. That's cool. That's really cool. Dang, didn't know you were such an engineer. Yeah, you know what? <laughs> if you go look at my handiwork, I arc welded the whole thing. It's not beautiful. Um, it's square tubing, yeah. but it works really well. So, Heck yeah. Eh, yeah. That's cool. Well, let's jump back a little bit more. Um, let's talk about um, what was your first vehicle? What got you into off-roading? Yes. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I grew up on this ranch. I've always, you know, before I was in the military, I lived out here in Southern California. So my big influence out here was Glamis and Ocotillo Wells and Johnson Valley. And um, so when I turned 16, I got a Jeep Cherokee. Actually, sorry, let me back that up. When I turned 16, I got an AMC Eagle. That was my first car. And I got that car for 500 bucks and it didn't really? run, but once I got it running, that thing ran great. And, um, I drove the wheels off that car. I eventually, what happened with that car was I blew the head gasket and then I replaced the head gasket in a parking lot. And when I put it all back together, I got the, um, the push rods mixed up. Oh. And I ended up having one slip out from the rocker and it, came through the um, valve cover and was sticking out of the valve cover into my hood. And I was like, okay, well, <laughs> now I've got to take all this apart again. And so I parked it and then um, I don't think I ever really fixed it correctly. I had the fuel cell start leaking or the gas tank start leaking on me. So I put a fuel cell in it, a racing fuel cell. And then um, I had the throttle stick open on me. I think, uh, I don't know. I ended up recycling the car and then I got yeah. a cheap XJ. And then, yeah, like you mentioned, when we did the intro to this channel, I've never owned a two wheel drive car except for a Toyota Prius. Pretty embarrassing. But oh, my geez. first car was, was really a unique 
vehicle. I never, I'd never heard of one. I haven't, you know, owned one since, but I really want to. Um, there's nothing more exciting to me right now than a four-wheel drive station wagon. You're right. Um, and it was funny because I knew I was talking to you, so I did a little bit of research on, um, you know, those AMC Eagles. And just today, Nitro Gear posted up on their stories, like, do you know what vehicle this is? And it was an Eagle. And, yes. so, <laughs> and so I commented in there like, good job, really proud of you. <laughs> and I yes, was like, so they're so cool though, that, you know, they're an original thing that you don't see every day. Like the old school yeah. freaking Toyota vans that had the nose that like dives down with, I think it was called the Previa or something like that. Super and ugly. It's, yeah. It's super ugly, horrible vehicle. Um, but it had, I think it had a 22 RE motor, which is the bomb, like a, amazing motor and it's four wheel drive. And it had four bucket seats and then a bench seat and the buckets could turn around. And it's like, this is actually a really cool vehicle, even though it's <laughs> God awfully ugly, but, yeah. um, I've always threatened that I was going to buy one of those. Like you've been trying to hunt down another Eagle for yourself. Yeah. Um, so the Eagle was, for those of you who don't know what it is, was essentially the like a, the early Jeep Cherokee. It had it was a station wagon car, but it had um, the inline six two fifty eight from from American Motors. It's a carbureted, uh, longer stroke than a four liter, um, maybe a little bit less reliable. And then it had um, two options: you could get it in a manual or automatic transmission. And then mm -hmm. it had a belt driven. Um, vacuum powered transfer case in it okay. and it had independent front suspension and a solid axle amc rear axle in it um but it was a high powered super lightweight four-wheel drive station wagon so before the um before a lot of cars with a similar build aspect to it but if you look at it next to a jeep cherokee um a lot of the technology that went into the AMC Eagle, which only had like mm -hmm. a $50 million budget, went to the Jeep Cherokee afterward. Okay. And actually, they only got like a... I want to say that the primary research for the Jeep YJ was through the AMC Eagle project. So the Jeep YJ, to, to move from a CJ7 to a Jeep YJ... They wanted to like modernize it, make the vehicle roll over less and a little bit safer to drive on the road. They were only given like a $10 million budget, but the AMC Eagle project had like a $50 million budget. So they over-engineered the AMC Eagle because they had the money for that. And then they used that research to build the Jeep YJ, which originally came with the 258 in it as well. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, yeah good old Barbie Jeeps, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, those, uh, I do, um, as you know, I have a podcast and then one of our, like, we call them our sister podcast. These two other guys that are called, they do a podcast called whiskey, wine, and wheeling. Uh, one of them has a YJ. And so, uh, we always tease the heck out of him. <laughs> They're good Jeeps. They're not well liked, um, by a lot of people, but they are really good Jeeps. And you just wheeled with one on 35s and something the other day, right? Yeah, I did. I was out on Fordyce. Um, yeah. yeah, it was on 35s. It was sprung over. It had an ARB in the front and a Detroit in the rear. And I mean, it did great, you know? Yeah. On And for the first um, like short section of Fordyce, it was doing fine. Um, it would not have been able to do some of those, the big gnarly obstacles out there. Um, but uh, for the, like, just drive to the obstacle, it was doing perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I know a lot of the guys that, um, that if you're going to build modestly, you want a coil sprung four linked Jeep, you want a TJ, mm -hmm. but if you're going to build aggressively or you're going to cut all of your suspension off of the frame and you're going to do custom triangulated four links and one ton axles and, right. you know, uh, Atlas transfer case and all the goodies, a lot of people prefer the YJ over the TJs. Why so um, a, I don't know the exact answer, but I think it has something to do with a stronger frame on the mm. YJs. Okay. So um, yeah, you'll see a lot more square headlights out there in the, like the bigger obstacles. Uh, links. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, that's really interesting. Um, I wonder if it's because they're cheap. 
I don't know, you know, because well, it could be that too. That. I mean, it's, it's a much cheaper platform to start with. Yeah. And for all intents and purposes, you're getting the same thing out of it because you're, you're going to put buckets in it. You're going to put mm-hmm. a, probably a twin stick transfer case in it. Your interior is just going to be bare metal floors with a dash. Like when you build to that level, it matters less about, you know, your creature comfort is not nearly as important to you. So Right. It makes sense if YJs are cheaper. And maybe that's the preferred reason. Yeah, I mean, it might be. Um, so uh, what was what was one of the things that actually got you into off-roading um, at the start? Was it just because of the trails and the, what is actually around you there with Glamis and Ocotillo Wells and Johnson Valley? Or um, did your friends do it or did your parents do it? Or, you know, it seems like you've had Jeeps in your life, you know, from way back when. So what yeah. started this love affair with, uh, off-roading? That's a good question, but it doesn't start with Jeeps. Um, I grew up riding motorcycles. And so when I was a really little kid, I was on quads out in the sand dunes. And then when I was about eight or nine, I transitioned from four wheels to two wheels. And so I was on bikes way bigger than my body size for most of my life because I was I was riding you know a YZ 400 or a YZ 426 at 11 12 years old because uh, it's the only thing I I blew up so many two strokes in the desert that um, that my dad had had enough of it and he put me on a big bike because the thumpers were the only things that could make it out there if I was on a little YZ85 or an RM100 or 125, I'd just be redlining that thing and melting the top ends on those bikes. So to keep up with everybody else in the sand dunes, I had to start on milk crates with my feet touching the milk crates. And then when everybody else stopped, I would just keep riding. Um, (laughs) Until somebody put a milk crate down for you? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Or if I could stop on the top of a sand dune just right with my left foot so that I could still kickstart with my right foot, I was okay. Um, yeah. But then when I was 13, I broke my leg. Um, go figure, that's bound to happen mm-hmm. on that motorcycle, the 426. So um, I was kind of confined to not riding motorcycles. I couldn't, I was, I was in and out of a wheelchair for almost two years. So um, I spent a lot of that time with my friends that had Baja bugs and Jeeps because I could still get in and out of them. So that was when I first started doing it. And then when I turned 16, I realized pretty quickly that I was obsessed with driving and I had a four wheel drive car. So I put that AMC Eagle through its paces and I not, not necessarily rock crawled it, but I took it places that nobody should take an AMC Eagle. Yeah. And um, that kind of kicked everything off to where when the Eagle broke down and I couldn't fix it, and I had to get another car. I wanted another four wheel drive and I wanted a bigger one. Um, but no, it's never really been in my family. We've got old Jeeps. We've got the Willys out here. We've got a Scrambler out here. Um, but I don't, the, the Willys has never run in my lifetime and the Scrambler is new to us. So that's a project we're just about to start. Um, we've never really had Jeeps that we took out and off-roaded. So it was something that I just kind of fell into. And then, Um, when I was in the military, I lived in Oklahoma and I had no car because I left my Jeep here in California and there was nowhere to go off-roading or that that I knew of at least. So I bought a big F-250 and I hauled my XR650R dirt bike out there to Oklahoma and then moved to Illinois with it. And then when I got to Illinois, I realized there was nowhere to ride a motorcycle because there's nothing but paved roads anywhere you go paved okay. roads and cornfields so i gave up on i mean i had a bike built for baja and i had nowhere to ride it it was dual sport but i had nowhere to ride it except for on the road and um it's not nearly as much fun to ride a dual sport on the road as it is to ride it off road so i ended up selling that motorcycle and then i traded the truck for another jeep and got back into jeeping because i could drive to missouri and go off roading down there so then i got right back into it and then i went through two more jeeps before i started crawl tv okay dang so uh have you ever had a cherokee yeah yeah so i've had four jeep cherokees oh i had 
my first one was a Cherokee Wagoneer. So it had, it was a limited, um, Cherokee limited Wagoneer. It had uh, wood paneling down the sides, chrome trim, chrome door handles, chrome mirrors, chrome, you know, all power windows, power seats, like way fancier wow. than it should have been. Um, but it had four headlights. So it, it doesn't look like a Cherokee if you if you Google okay. it. A Cherokee Wagoneer is like such an oddball Jeep. But yeah. um, every one I had after that, I, I went to a 96. Oh, I'm trying to remember the years that I had. I bounced around in the 90s, 96 and on. Because those were nice. better years. Mm -hmm. um but yeah four liter aw4 transmission dana 35s i my last cherokee that i had i put a um i can't remember what it was now 8.25 chrysler rear axle in it okay something else you know i was trying right. to build it i long armed it and did a whole bunch of stuff to it oh, but wow. yeah i've been through a lot of them i've trashed all of them too yeah four jeeps yeah so a lot of people don't know this about me being the toyota guy that i am i actually started learning how to drive a manual on my parents cherokee oh yeah uh-huh uh we had a cherokee in the family for about a few months when i turned 15 16 and it was a lemon like we act <laughs> i think we actually turned it in under the lemon law and oh, uh it was wow. bad yeah and so but I had a very small stint when the very first four wheel drive vehicle that I was driving was a Cherokee and it was, yes. I, I, it went everywhere and it had a low, you know, low transfer case gear in it. And, um, it had a four liter and I mean, I thought it was indestructible. Um, yeah. and part of the lemon law factor that my parents probably thought of that there was a lot of problems was probably a lot my fault and they just <laughs> didn't realize it. <laughs> But yeah, you just so. didn't tell them that you were grinding the gears out there. Oh no, or it caught air a few times. No, <laughs> <laughs> I went to go buy a Jeep Cherokee one time, and I met the guy at night, and it was outside of a yeah. Sioux plantation, and I just didn't get the right vibe from him to begin with. But mm -hmm. I showed up, and one of the headlights had like, uh, like a cart cardboard shim under it because the headlight wasn't like secured. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jeep ran great. It just looked like, you know, a high school kid had been driving it. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking around. He's, I went there with a friend of mine and he's just sitting there chit chatting with my friend and I'm looking over the vehicle and I climb underneath it and I pulled out, I'm not kidding you, like a four foot long branch that had come through the floorboard and underneath the carpet. And I like wow. yanked it out and he's like, yeah, we've off-roaded this thing pretty hard. And I was like, yeah, I'm not buying it. No. <laughs> like, <laughs> good luck no, with your sale. You. Yeah. You got a hole in your floor, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'd wow. like yank it out. All right. Well, so let's move forward in time. What are you driving now? What is Dozer? Let's, uh, let's talk about Dozer a little bit and uh, the build that you've been doing. Okay. Yeah. So um, in 2015, I bought, uh, sorry, in 2013, I bought a 2012 JK. It was a two door, six speed. Um, and I ended up rolling it. Mm -hmm. And that was in early 2016. So most of my YouTube channel has been building the Jeep that I have now, which is outside. And um, it is a 2012, just like the last one, um, Rubicon JKU. Um, that was completely stock when I got it. Somebody had taken really good care of it. I love to kill vehicles um this one hasn't died on me yet but i have mistreated it a lot and i haven't been making youtube videos for the last nine months so youtube was like a saving grace for my vehicles because i'm teaching people how to do maintenance and it's making me keep up with my own maintenance so like any little steering issue i had or mm -hmm. any vibration or any noise i'm like let's address this and then i'll make a video on it um since i haven't really been doing that the jeep has mostly been sitting but um yeah, I've got it outside. Let me check my battery on my phone here, and then I'll see if I can take you guys out there. I am at 17%, so I'm actually good. All right. Let's go, let's go, uh, see let's go on a field trip. Okay. <laughs> so what was the first install you did on Dozer? 
I put a CB radio in it. It was actually the first thing I did. The the seventy five X S X something. Uh, WX. The Cobra. Yeah. That's, yeah. The handheld. That was the very I, first thing I did. I bought one of those because of your video. Oh no, kidding. Yeah, and I ha still haven't installed it. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the Jeep. Um, right now it is doorless and topless because this is Southern California, but it has a trailer attached to it because I've been taking trash out and running it to the dump. But this is the first, first thing I installed right here. Nice. Ooh. And the Jeep runs good. Um, it, you know, it's, it's been well-maintained, but it has a lot of weird little nuances to it that I have yet to address. I actually just got off the phone with Raceline Wheels yesterday and my wheels are ready to pick up. So the build project, which is gonna go on at the Rockstar Garage in Lake Elsinore. So if you guys know um, Gridlock or Mischief Maker JKU or like the Rockstar Garage has like a ton of Toyotas, the Pandra, um, mm -hmm. all those guys are part of that Rockstar Garage group and they have um, the big shop which would be way easier to work at than my house. But I've got this big pile of parts here. And this has a big brake kit. Uh, I've got a new steering knuckle. I've got all new two and a half ton steering. Um, let's see what else. 538 gears and master rebuild kits. Sorry, it was really windy out there. Um, what else? Obviously race line wheels. Um, oh, and Lucas Oil products sent out coolant. Gear oil, braking oil, um, engine oil. I got a whole bunch of stuff. So I'm going to be doing basically a full teardown on that Jeep just to bring it back to where it should be for Crawl TV. And then what I'm doing with Baja Designs as well, because I'm actually doing most of my West Coast Jeep shows with my Jeep. So a lot of the Jeep Jamborees, uh, the Jeep Jamboree Rubicon, Jeep Jamboree Big Bear, um, anything we do at Moab or Sand Hollow, Utah, like Trail Hero. I'll be out at those events with my Jeep. So it needs to be somewhat usable. Nice. I really hope all this chaos is over by Trail Hero. I want to go down to that this next year so bad. If it's not over by Trail Hero, I am like considering just moving to Australia. It's <laughs> so over this. Yeah. Um, I think Australia is having the same problems though, aren't they? Yeah, I know. There's no escaping it. I have but, my really good buddy is actually at Sand Hollow right now because it's open. You yeah. You can go there. Yeah. We're just not really supposed to leave our areas. So yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that's uh yeah, it's a bummer. Let's see. Um, we have a few questions coming in. Um King um what is this? Uh Desin Dessinger's Garage ask what's your favorite trail to run king's disaster garage king's disaster to garage yeah yeah he's at okay um my favorite trail oh that is a good question so i'm not a fan of being cold and i'm not a fan of altitude um so that wipes out a lot of the trails that I've been on out here in California so far. Even Johnson mm -hmm. Valley, I froze my butt off every time I went to Johnson Valley. Um, and, you know, you die of heat in the daytime. I think my favorite trail would either be the, I think, what's the name of it? Heroes Run in Sand Hollow. Okay. Um, it's a trail that has like a bunch of plaques for all the wars that the U.S. has been in. Oh, wow. I can't remember, the, can't remember the name of the trail, though. Um, but also if I just want like a good, relaxing, like fun day, the whole Cane Creek run with like all 54 river crossings and Hamburger Hill is a really fun day out in Moab. Oh, cool. Um, I haven't done that one. Yeah. It's no. a good one. Just, it takes a, it takes a full day if you just kind of bump along and stop for lunch and, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully nobody breaks. Um, but it's nothing extreme. Like I love jeeping, but like I've been paying for this Jeep for five years now. Right. I'm not really a huge fan of pushing it to the limits. Like I've done um, Rusty Nail in Moab. I've done Hell's Revenge. I've done the Moab Rim, like some of the harder trails. Um, I haven't done Pritchett in it because there's just a few of them where I'm just like, ah, like 
at the end of the day, like this is not a dedicated rock bouncer. So right. I don't know. Um, I push it pretty hard, but n no harder than I want to. You know, I actually really enjoy just getting out there in the open. That sounds very overlandy of me, but yeah. <laughs> when are you getting the rooftop tent? <laughs> <laughs> Never. Yeah. Uh, Brian Murphy asked, how many times did you change the oil after you flooded the JK? Um, I think right now I flooded the JK in, that would have been December of 2018. Mm. So it's been a year and a half. Um, I think I've changed the oil about 10 or 11 times now, but yeah. I think right after that happened, um, I think right after it happened, I changed the oil four to five times within like two or 300 miles because wow. I was so scared that I was going to lose my engine. I mean, sure. it was filled with my whole crankcase was filled with muddy water and there's, there's not a lot you can do to recover an engine after that happens normally, especially after it was running with muddy water in the crankcase. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm sure I've got bearing damage, but I've put 10,000 miles on the Jeep. No, more, way more than that. I've probably put like 15,000 miles on the Jeep since then. So Dang. it's still doing just fine. So is um, our 60s in the future? Yes. Yes, they are. And unfortunately, if you do things backwards like I do, um, you get five lug wheels and you get five lug big brake kits and you get a truss for a Dana 44 and you get 538 gears for a Dana 44 and ball joints for a Dana 44 and everything for a Dana 44. Um, so when it comes, to, even my steering is axle specific. So when it comes time to um, jump to Dana 60s or a Dana 60 front and a 14 bolt rear or you know, mm -hmm. drop in crate axles or whatever the case may be. Um, it's something that I'm seriously thinking about, but when the time comes to do all that, it's a bigger investment for me because I've done things backwards. So when you brought this up, um, I don't know when that was, you recently brought it up to me and you just said, Hey, like this would be a good talking point. If you want to talk about the fact that you're still running factory axles. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, because I can explain to people to do as I say and not as I do. The well, money that I there because yeah, that's the, where right where I was leading. Perfect. <laughs> so the money that goes into um, wheels and brakes and trussing, I haven't sleeved my axles because I don't believe in sleeving axles. Um, but aftermarket ball joints and you know control arm skids and track bar brackets and steering and everything that's so specific to your axles. Um, it adds up really quick. And then mm -hmm. when it comes time to upgrade them, you run into the issue of having to replace everything else too. Now I have seen some cool options out there where you still have like a Dana 6044 um, hybrid axle. So you would have a Dana 60 ring and pinion, um, 35 spline shafts, but five on five semi float axle shafts. Mm. So I think Curry, um, actually Kings five garage. I'm pretty sure he's got a Curry semi float, but it's a 60 hybrid. So, hmm. and even, um, you know, the Jeep Terramoto that did King and the hammers this year. Yes. The gen right off road one. Yeah. That is a five lug Jeep. Wow. And it surprised the crap out of me when I, when I learned that, I mean, it's, it's a very stout five lug Jeep, but mm -hmm. it is, five lugs so the new I guess tundras are five lugs yeah i they guess there are a six lug to a five lug i don't know why yeah. i guess there are ways around it um but the one thing that i've always felt like is if you're gonna upgrade from a ball joint front end and a semi float rear end you want to get rid of wheel hubs you want to get rid of ball joints and you want to get rid of semi float Mm -hmm. That's just always been my opinion. If you want to upgrade to big boy axles, most of the time you want kingpin axles, you want full float 
and you want locking hubs and you want everything so redundant mm -hmm. that if something breaks, you can pull an axle shaft out and keep going. Right. Rather than having a bent axle flange and unless you carry a spare axle flange and a bearing puller, you're stuck. Mm -hmm. So for a long time, I did carry a spare um, rear axle shaft for my Jeep for that reason. Wow. But so let's uh, let's talk about your 44s that you're running now because you have 39, 39 and a half. Uh, what are they, the KM3s? Yeah, so <laughs> they're 39, 13, 5, 17s. Mm -hmm. um, they're big balloony tires. They measure true at about 38 inches tall. Mm -hmm. um, another important thing to point out with my Jeep is that I have the factory steering box with no hydro assist. So when you That's... aired, it didn't affect me very much with okay. the 37s. When I had 37s, I could air down. It, my steering was tight because the footprint of the tire is so much bigger. You know, you're, you're airing down, you're creating this huge base that you now have to turn. And so when you're on things like sandstone and, or um, slick rock, you know, you have so much traction that yeah. turning an aired down tire is like impossible. But I added an extra inch of width to my tires and my 39s measured true at about 38, but my 37s measured true at about 36 and a half. So it's an extra inch and a half of height and an extra mm -hmm. inch of width and aired down. It's too much surface area to make it easy to steer. Um, yeah. And one of my bigger concerns is that you put all this stress in your steering wheel and that sends that stress down the line through your um, steering shaft into your steering box and then out through your sector shaft. And I have a sector shaft brace in my Jeep, but when you, I mean, that's an incredible amount of pressure applied through power steering. And so you've got this little splined gear that's trying to turn all your steering and that is your point of failure. But the problem is if you break a sector shaft on a trail, you are really, really, really up shit creek. Like there's, there's no steering. It's not easy to t tow you out. There's no fix. So, um, hydro assist is probably, it's probably the most important thing I could do to my build right now to make it trail worthy for sure. Yeah. My, uh, co-host on the podcast, we did his hydro assist fairly recently and he, uh, was on 37s at the time. And he said that um, after the fact, after we installed it, he said, I should have done this before I even locked my vehicle. It made such a difference um, off-roading. Yeah. Yeah. That, um, you know, just being able to turn and not really worrying about like, you know, having to reverse and do the Austin Powers move to get your tires around. Exactly. You know, it's just, you can just whoop, like, it's not quite full hydro feel, but you know, you still have the gear ratios in there. So yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's really nice. I, I would highly advise people to go and do that if they are having massive tires and, and they're not going to go the full hydro route. And, you know, here in California, it's not legal to drive a full hydro right. vehicle on the street. Um, and so the farthest that we can kind of take our vehicles is hydro assist. And it makes all the difference in the world. It's really, really good. You should do yeah. it. Yeah, I know. I know. You're pointing right at me. I feel it. I feel the judgment through the yeah. screen here, but no, it's, it's an important thing. So it's on the list. Um, as I tear this Jeep down and start building it back up, it's mm -hmm. one of those things that I am going to be coming out of pocket for pretty heavily because it's, it's important. Definitely. Um, and it really does make it safer too, when you're out there off-roading, because like you said, sometimes when you have to Austin powers, your vehicle, you're on the edge of a cliff. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not the best time to be fighting against your steering wheel. So and sometimes you're in the perfect position and all you've got to do is turn your steering wheel one quarter of a turn to the left and then you're lined up to just whole shot yeah. it and you can't. No. Um, yeah. And so it, it puts you in a worse position to, to endanger yourself or break things. It's just, I've, I've driven full hydro Jeeps, I've driven hydro assist Jeeps, and then I've driven my Jeep. It's a big difference. Mm -hmm. But going back to the Dana 44s things, um, I've got a front Dana 44 with 538 gears and a moto built truss. Um, it's got Mevo tech ball joints, power stop brakes, um, Timken hubs in it, <sighs> nitro, nitro gear and axle, axle shafts, um, still 32 spline and Synergy lower control arm skids. Um, 
but other than that, <laughs> other than those minor modifications, it's still mm -hmm. Jane of 44. I haven't, um, I don't feel like I've done anything excessive to it other than spend money on it, which right. again, once you build a Dana 44 up to a certain point, you've spent half the money it would cost to just go straight from stock to one ton. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking, I'm talking crate axle. I mean, it, it costs three grand per axle to do what I just mentioned. Right. And then the rear axle isn't trust, um, but it is geared and it has nitro gear and axle chromoly shafts in it. Um, and that's about it. I haven't really done anything to that, that part. Right. But. Yeah. And, um, like you kind of mentioned earlier, you know, it's like, you're spending all this money on building this up so that you can put bigger tires on it. And then, you know, you're spending all the money on the 44, but you can't really use any of that, those parts off of the 44 for the 60 or, uh, you know, a curry axle, like, um, King's garage mentioned, he said, do a 60 front and a curry rear, which would be a good combo as well. Um, yeah. but you can't use the parts that you're upgrading. You know, you're not going to use your axle shafts. You're not going to use those ball joints, you know, none of it carries over. So, you know, you kind of need to think about what's your end goal. You know, how big 100%. of a tire do I want? Am I only going to go 37s? Then maybe 44s are going to be okay. Do I want to go up to 40s? Then maybe I need to think about getting a bigger axle. Exactly right. Yeah. So understanding what limit you're going to push and what, you know, how big are you going to go from mm -hmm. the very beginning um, will help you decide what you should be spending your money on. Absolutely. It's, if I could go back and do it all again, a lot of it, I would do the same. Um, and by that, I mean, I bought my Jeep um, and I could have paid my Jeep off cash when I bought it. But I chose not to uh, because I had great financing on it. Mm -hmm. And so I put half down and then I took that other half and I bought basically your starter kit. I bought a full mid-arm kit for it, um, steering, track bars, wheels, tires, exhaust, skid plates, like just your normal stuff. Like there's some right. things you just have to buy. Um, but it got me to a great starting point where I was happy with it right away because I was not happy with it stock. I didn't want to drive it stock forever until I could save up for one tons, which is, I can't advise anybody else to do that either. That's not why you want a vehicle, right? Right. You want to be able to take it out and enjoy it. So I got mine on 35. It was, it was good enough to where I could take it out and have fun with it. Um, but beyond that, I probably should have just stayed where I was, done minor upgrades, and then figured out what my end goal was, and then shot my shot, you know? Mm -hmm. Because I've, I'm going through every single step where you can easily skip steps three and four and go straight to five. Sure. Absolutely. Um, King's Disaster Garage asks, how do you feel about double beadlocks? Um, I don't think that they're necessary. Um, I guess my question would be like what double beadlocks? So if he's talking like a Hutchinson, which has like a PVC insert in it, and basically there's two halves of a wheel mm -hmm. and bolts are in the center of the wheel rather than around the rim, like most beadlocks. So when you bolt those two halves of the wheel together, the PVC insert pushes the bead against the lip of the rim on both sides, inside and Got outside. It. it creates a double bead lock. Um, those wheels are great, but they're prone to leaking. And then I just personally, I don't, I don't off-road hard enough to need a double bead lock. I barely off-road hard enough to need a single bead lock. Um, they're cool. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily have an opinion on double bead locks. Um, okay but I have dealt with Hutchinson's in the past and they're really, really good. But first get them and you first mount your tires, you have to basically tear them up to like 60 PSI and leave them for 24 hours and then come back and see if any of them leak because they're that prone to having any kind of, it's a two piece wheel, you know? Mm -hmm. And what if they do leak? What, what do you end up doing? You, I think normally you just have to take them back apart, reseal everything, put it all back together so it all fits and then try again dang okay bummer uh brian murphy asks in hindsight would you buy somebody else's project vehicle instead of starting with uh like a bone stock one like you did 
that's a good question, but it's kind of a, I'll have a two part answer for it. So um, if you know more than the person selling the vehicle, you're in a good position to buy it because you can't just say, oh, this Jeep has a, or this Toyota truck or anything. You mm -hmm. can't just walk up to it and say, oh, it has a four inch lift on it. It has the size tire that I want. It looks great. I'll take it because as you know, as I know, as anybody else knows, that could be a icon vehicle dynamics lift, or it could be a zone lift, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so you have to be able to recognize every little individual part and have a lot of detail on the build in order to make a decision on whether you should buy something that somebody else has built or build it yourself. I can tell you, you're going to save yourself a lot of heartache if you know what you're looking for and you buy it done. Absolutely. There's no yeah. doubt because going through it piece by piece, check by check, um, you know, paying retail for all your parts and then installing all your parts yourself. It's exhausting. But um, the only benefit to that is that you know exactly what you what you've got and what you don't have and what you need. And, you know, you you're going to build it exactly to how you like it. Now, the other part that I would say, the other half of this answer is that if you know you want something that's dedicated off road, absolutely. I would buy something somebody else already built. I'd mm -hmm. go out and I'd find a TJ on one ton axles with an LS motor in it or ready for an LS motor. And that already has a cage, you know, like stuff is already done to it. And I would build off of that platform mm -hmm. because that makes so much more sense to go buy a truck and a trailer and take something out. If, if you want to just go rock crawl it. Now, if you're, if you're building something to go out camping and stuff like that, and then back to question one, but right. your answer, one. but yeah. Yeah. I always advise people to look for a build, uh, instead of starting at scratch, cause you're going to find, you're going to, you can never buy a vehicle and, and spend the money to build it to that level and expect to be the, at that same price range. You Absolutely know? right. No, you you're hundred percent so, correct. Yeah, and the so, craziest thing that I try to explain to people is that I've got a $30,000 Jeep. That's what it was mm -hmm. from the factory. That's how I bought it. I have put $30,000 in aftermarket parts into that Jeep. Right. If I were to sell that Jeep today, it would be worth $30,000. Yeah. So there's no money in, in, in aftermarket. No. Once it's on the vehicle, it's a used part and it doesn't count toward the overall cost of the build. Right. So you're, you're absolutely right. If somebody is, if they know that they want to be at a certain level and they can find a vehicle that's halfway there or all the way there, they're mm -hmm. probably going to get it for around the same price as a stock one. Yeah. No, definitely. And I think that, you know, or they'll find it maybe even a little cheaper depending on what they're looking for. But you do bring up a really great point on knowing what you want to get and knowing the research or doing the research and finding out, you know, what lift kits or how is it built. And even Brian just commented in the chat, like even how good the welds are on the vehicle, you know, go look at those yeah. details that you need yeah. to be paying attention to. You know, don't look at somebody that has booger welds on it compared to these people that have are rolling dimes, you know, so, yeah, you know, that all that all comes down to into play of what you're looking for. I've always I would if somebody's looking to get into off roading, I would say find a rig that's already built or, you know, a started project that's been abandoned, you know, and go that yeah. direction. So I'm going to plug you guys in here. My phone is dying. Uh oh, well, only a few more questions to go and then we can leave you. Um, I just wanted to know what if, um, what is like the next big thing for Crawl TV? What's coming down the line? What is uh, the big project that you are going to be taking forth? Is it going to be Dozer or something else? <laughs> yes. um, the very next thing that I have lined up will be Dozer. Um, I've got new wheels. I'm keeping mm -hmm. the cam 3s But like I said, I mean, I've got boxes and boxes of parts outside. I've been slowly collecting things to bring this Jeep back to exactly where I want it. Okay. Once that's done though, um, I'm probably not going to do a ton more on that until it's time for one tons. I think I'm going to go pick up probably some junkyard axles um, and start doing smaller videos on a one ton swap, but those will okay. be, those will be spaced out. 
you know, it's, it's going to mm-hmm. be a one ton swap is really, really expensive. Um, you know, just, just the gears, the shafts, the hubs, the steering, the, all the trusts, your shock mounts, your, everything is expensive on that. So it's going to take me a while to build one ton axles. Um, in the meantime, though, I have been working with a few companies, um, kind of behind the scenes because it's not a public project, but I will be building a Jeep Scrambler, but it's going to be a very interesting build, uh, potentially diesel build, and it's going to be an overland build. So it's, it's completely cool. outside of everything that I've ever done. Okay. Uh, so my working- rooftop tent comment might not have been too far off. No, probably not. Not for this. It w- I probably will have a ten on it. Nice. Um, but it's going to be something just completely different because of where I live now in California. I want something with great range, and I want something that's um, just comfortable to drive, not super hardcore. The only hardcore stuff that I run into out here is the closest, I'd say, is going to be somewhat like Borrego Springs, Ocotillo Wells, but for the most part, okay. it's all the way out in Johnson Valley. Mostly what I'm, what I'm finding out here in Southern California is, is, you know, I've, I can, I've got Baja that I can go to right across the border. And then I can wander all the way out to Arizona without hitting anything extreme. Wow. So there's a lot of cool stuff that I'd like to see. And I'd like to do some different off-roading. Okay. Um, that's not exactly the kind of event where I would have to, ideally trailer a vehicle out and trailer at home because I might break it. Got it. Makes yeah. sense. A few more questions came into the feed. Uh, AZ Westside Wheelers is here and uh, they said, any thoughts on doing an engine swap down the line? Yes. So Joe and Erica, hi. Um, engine swap is definitely something that I'm thinking about. Um, if you guys know or don't know, um, When I lived in Florida, I worked for a company called Bruiser Conversions, and I did LS swaps all day long. Um, We did LS swaps in JKs, JLs, um, JTs, all basically any Jeep platform. TJs, Mm -hmm. we'd we'd LS swap them. We had our own um, vehicle-specific kits for those, but the JK was the most common, the 2012 and up, because it pairs perfectly um, to the WA580 five-speed Jeep uh transmission which is actually a mercedes transmission and it can hold up to 500 horsepower no problem oh cool so we throw these all aluminum block ls3s in there with a custom harness and a tune and send them down the road and i know exactly how to do it so it's not too far outside of my wheelhouse the only difference is that i wouldn't be dropping 30 grand on a all aluminum block LS3 because that's just a little bit expensive. So um, right as I was leaving Bruiser Conversions, they came out with a kit called their Junkyard Dog Kit. Um, And it is just the PCM, the tuned PCM and the harness. And it's, I think it's, it's got a little more in it than that. It's got a PCM tuned uh, harness, a reluctor wheel, um, you know, a couple things, but mm-hmm. for the most part, it's everything that you need to go find a 5.3 or a 6.0 LS. And it comes with the motor mounts. All you have to do is cut your factory motor mounts out, weld in the new motor mounts, which are keyed. So they fall right into place. It's, there's no guesswork. Once you weld those motor mounts in, you're ready to do minor modifications to your LS and drop it in your Jeep. It can be cool. done. Realistically, it can be done for less than $15,000. Nice. Yeah. So, yeah. Joe and Erica said, yes, we remember we want to do one as well. <laughs> so. Yes. Nice. Uh, Brian Murphy also commented. He said, is there any trails you want to run after you do a one ton swap? Yeah. Um, I think I'd like to do Sledgehammer in Johnson okay. Valley. Mm-hmm. And I would like to do... Um, Pritchett Canyon in Moab. Those are, and then the, every trail in Sand Hollow is like hardcore. Yeah. I mean, a lot of them put me on edge already, but um, those are the two that I've bowed out of. That's the only okay. reason I want to do those two. Sledgehammer mm-hmm. and Pritchett are the only two trails where I've ever been like, no, <laughs> yeah. I'm not taking my Jeep up this. No thanks. Okay. So th- I, want, I want some redemption, really. 
And once the tons are on there, you're going to go back and redeem yourself. Absolutely. There you go. Excellent. All right, Jared, with this was a lot of fun. I want to give you the yeah. opportunity to plug yourself, do a little shout out, tell people where they can find you, um, all the different things that you're doing. This is your moment to shine. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, so if you guys haven't figured it out yet, my YouTube channel is Crawl TV. You can search that in the YouTubes and find me. Um, at one point, I had more channels than what I have now, but I have a Facebook page called Crawl TV as well as a Facebook group called Crawl TV, the group. Um, and in that group, we discuss, um, it's similarly forum-based tech talk uh, questions, um, you know, reader rigs, things like that. And then um, I also have Instagram, which is at Crawl TV. So I've kept my my channels pretty similar so that they're all easy to find and interlinked. Um, I'm not running anything else right now at, at the moment. I'm, I shut down Twitter and I shut down Patreon because it's, it's a lot to keep up on when you're not making videos. And it's, you know, it's just like, as you know, um, once you get that, those gears rolling, you've got to stay on top of them. You've got to update mm -hmm. people. And um, I'm just slowly getting back into that. So I don't even, you know, you can't buy a crawl TV sticker right now. You can't buy merchandise. Um, that's all coming back with the channel, starting with this big push to get the Jeep done, to uh, put these new wheels on, the new steering, um, and get the full full build done so that it's ready to hit the trails again with Baja Designs and as crawl TV. So two-parter. But um, yeah, Jimmy, thank you for the opportunity to come on here and chat with you, man. This has been fun. And uh, yes. I always enjoy hanging out with you. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, um, not many people know, but, you know, between the, you and I and, you know, I think it was we were on early chats trying to figure out how to get me started on YouTube, you know, and you were one of the yeah. big pushes for me, you know, and getting me started on YouTube. And I just want to say a big thank you for all the help that you did behind the scenes and helping me out start my channel. So that was awesome. Yeah, man. Well, actually, same thanks goes right back to you. I remember when your first video aired July 4th, 2017. And then um, up to July 4th, 2017, I think you planned on creating Snail Trail 4x4 for about a year. I did. And <laughs> in that time, you did a lot of research and you shared a lot with me when I was still at that point, 2017, I think I only had 3,000 YouTube subscribers. Mm -hmm. um, so in that time frame, I was um, still learning YouTube myself. And I didn't, I mean, I didn't even know what a thumbnail was until you showed me. So, right. I, I remember, dude, you need to add text to your thumbnails. Yeah. And I like <laughs> sent you over some thumbnails with text on it. You know, yeah. and you're like, oh, wow, this is cool. Great. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we have come that far. Mm -hmm. So it's always fun to reconnect. Definitely. Definitely. Well, well, hopefully I'll see you again at SEMA this year um, yes. coming up. That'll be fun. And hopefully Trail Hero and maybe some other places in between if they will open up the borders for us. I sure hope so. I'd love to come up there and go wheeling with you. I would love that as well. Let's arrange it sometime soon. But Jarrett, thanks so much for hanging out. I appreciate it. All right. We'll see you guys. Yeah. Bye.